so now for something completely different. You've heard me develop, uh, present a little bit of developmental psychology. Um, and now this is a very different kind of thing. This is actually sort of a, a quantitative ethnography, uh, in a sense. The units of analysis here are rituals, not people. And uh, the main question then for this work package is, are religious rituals structured by natural thought in some interesting ways? And uh, Ryan Hornbeck and I have been uh, leading this team, but we've had a lot of help as well. And I'm drawing very heavily on the uh, theoretical work of Tom Lawson and Robert McCauley, uh, two of the really early uh, players in this area. Robert McCauley, I've mentioned, is a, 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 a philosopher of science. Uh, Tom Lawson is an African religion specialist. And, uh, and they uh, teamed up to do a couple of books on uh, what's called the ritual form hypothesis. And the basic idea is that they're trying to account for cross-culturally recurrent patterns in religious rituals by appealing to what kinds of cognitive systems are at play when we experience a religious ritual. Now to do that, they've got to use a, a narrowly circumscribed uh, definition of religious ritual. Because that term ritual, of course, can mean all kinds of different things. And as Macaulay likes to say, a definition is a theory in brief. And they're fully aware of that. And so you're going to notice this definition of religious ritual. It's theoretically loaded, and it's meant to only capture sort of a narrow range of what you might normally think of as religious rituals. Lots of things don't count under this, because they want to say there's certain kinds of um, psychological mechanisms that need to be operating in a particular kind of way to pick out this class of uh, cultural expression that we might call religious ritual. Okay, so they start with their basic sort of mechanism is the action representation system, they call it. Um, they note that it's really important in life for humans to be able to distinguish between events and actions. And that word actions is picking out those events that are caused by an intentional agent. Someone is deliberately doing something. So if this beautiful chandelier were to fall on me right now, that would be an event. Unless Dr. Hornbeck had somehow engineered for it to fall on me, then it was an action. He made it fall on me. He did something to me. Um, I don't know why he would, but you know, <laughs> can't trust that guy. Um, it's his birthday, so I'm teasing him a little bit, but we'll get to that. Ah, uh, okay. So this really important difference between actions and events, and why is it so important? Because if you think an action is a mere event, somebody didn't mean to do it, you're not going to know why it came about the right way. You're not going to be able to avoid it in the future. Okay? It's going to be harder to anticipate. You're going to get the causal mechanisms wrong. So it's really important to know who caused what to happen. They argue that this action representation system does that work for us. And it does that work for us in ordinary life, and it does that work for us in religious rituals too. So they're going to specify that a religious ritual has to be an action. All right, first and foremost, but it's, it's a special kind of action. It's got three sort of you can think of these as representational slots, or three types of information that have to be kept track of to, uh, to, to represent, to parse, to understand the religious ritual. An agent slot, an instrument or act slot, and a patient slot, okay? So someone does something, perhaps by means of some kind of instrument, to someone, okay? Hornbeck drops chandelier on Barrett. Okay? Mean guy. All right? That's an action uh, of, a, of a particular sort that has a patient. Okay? So for religious rituals to count, they need to have these slots. All right, then they add something they call the principle of superhuman agency, which is kind of interesting. What they say is that for it to count as a religious ritual in their, what they want to explain, the action has to make some kind of appeal to supernatural causation. 
agency, action, all right? We do a certain act and it gets the gods to do something. Or while, when we do this, it is invoking the action of the god directly. In some way, in that action representation system, in that structure, a superhuman agent needs to be doing something or represented somewhere, okay? So this separates this kind of ritual from their definition of religious ritual from many others that we might think of as rituals that we do in a religious context. Okay, so somebody who is just, um, oh, I don't know, uh, doing a, an annual kind of uh, a remembrance feast. Well, if the gods aren't acting through that or because of that, it doesn't count. It might be a good time, it might be heavily structured, it might be culturally specified, it might be repetitive, but it's not counting for them as, as a religious ritual. So we're, we're narrowing the playing field here. Okay, so a superhuman agent needs to be somewhere in this action structure. And then they put up this little wall here. I've adapted these illustrations from one of their books, actually. And, um, or actually maybe Macaulay did and I stole his slides. I don't know. I better go back and check. Um, they introduced this principle of superhuman agency and the basic idea is, look, there are two main categories of religious rituals, one in which the gods are on the agent side of things, and one in which they're sort of on the recipient or action side of things, okay? Religious rituals in which a representative of the divine or of a god or a superhuman agent is doing something. These are the easy ones to pick out is when the priest is doing something. And it has to be a priest or a holy person doing something. Versus those in which either the god is a recipient of the action, as in a sacrifice, you're giving something to the god, you're acting on the god. Or there's a special instrument as part of the action, a sacred object that is bringing in the power of the gods in that situation, making it a special action, okay, marking this off from ordinary mundane stuff. Okay, so this is this big wall, and why is that? Because then they say we can divide religious rituals into two basic classes, okay? Um, there, there are three, but they, these two go together, right? So they, they identify what they call special agent rituals, special agent rituals. This is where the, the, the god is referred to here. Special instrument rituals, okay? Special patient rituals. So inclusion of special agents in the action representation structure automatically, they say, untutored, generate a number of intuitions about the character of a religious ritual. Okay, note this is a really radical claim. They're saying you don't need to know the meaning of the ritual. You don't need deep cultural knowledge. You just need to know a few little things about what the structure looks like. And then for free, you get certain intuitions about how it should go or how it can be done. These, these, these particular predictions, uh, religious studies people have noticed this stuff a long time ago, that certain rituals are repetitive, you do them over and over again, and kind of boring. Others you do pretty rarely, and they're really, really exciting. Okay? In fact, we sometimes talk about, oh, it's just, just ritual behavior. You do it over and over again, it's sort of plodding and boring. But we also know there are these really exciting rituals Wow, you get all pumped up, but you don't do those very often. Okay, so those observations about the features of rituals, lots of people have made. As far as we can tell, they're the first people to try to actually capture them all under one sort of causal mechanism. All right, so it's an interesting and bold claim. Is it right? Well, they project a, a couple of specific predictions here. That special agent rituals people will have the intuition that they can only be done once, okay? Um, to bring about the same state of affairs, all right? Whereas special instrument and special patient rituals are, can be performed many times, and that people will just have that intuition. Even if you're not from that cultural system, you'll actually probably have that intuition once you hear the ritual described, oh yeah, I guess you can do that again. Okay? Again, bold claim, let alone people within the tradition. So that's repeatability predicted. Special agents, 
do it one time. Special patient and special instrument, you can do that over and over again. Reversibility. Well, special, special agent rituals can only be reversed through other rituals. But there's that potential. Whereas special instrument and special patient rituals are irreversible. You don't do them. You can't undo them. Uh, here's, uh, this is sort of a, a Christian example. You can't take back Holy Communion. All right? Once you take communion, you can't go, you know what, I want to undo that. No. Um, think about this. If you uh, burn incense for an ancestor, can you take that back? Can you undo that? No. But you can defrock a priest, special agent ritual. You can undo that. You can desacralize a sacred space, potentially, but you would need to do it ritually. Okay, so you see these are our, our kind of flip side uh, predictions. So those are the general predictions. They've got one more here, and it has to do with they call sensory pageantry. The bells and smells, the, you know, the, the sights, the sounds, meant to gin up emotional response. Here, too, they say, well, look, in, within the same system, within the same community, special agent rituals will tend to have higher degrees of sensory pageantry compared to special instrument and special patient rituals. Why? The gods are acting, and you've got to feel it. Okay? Your emotions need to verify that. I put it in this sort of, it needs to. Because if the rituals don't do that, people are going to think something's wrong, and so there's going to be a selection process that special agent rituals where people are saying, the gods just did something important in your life and you had no emotional response, you're going to not be convinced and we're going to change that ritual or stop doing it. Whereas if it's got the right features, yeah, that's worth doing. I can tell that something happened there. All right, so examples. Uh, Melanesian so-called rites of terror, uh, <laughs> done in places like uh, New Guinea, for instance, are typically of a special agent form. These are rites of passage, uh, initiation sorts of things, and they are off the charts in terms of sensory pageantry. I mean, starvation, beating, burning, all kinds of stuff. I mean, really nasty things, scarring, a lot different than, you know, sort of the mundane stuff you do over and over again. Weddings are special agent rituals. They tend to be very high in sensory pageantry compared to the other kinds of rituals that you do. Okay, so those are their predictions. In short, they've got, a, they've got actually a few more, um, but those are the ones that we're focusing on here. And our, really our question is, well, do, do Chinese rituals fit Boston and Macaulay's predictions? All right, we've looked at a couple of other kinds of religious traditions and groups. Um, we, uh, Brian Malley and myself, have um, ask informants to tell us about their rituals. These Our informants were Hindu, uh, Muslim, and Jewish. And we were asked them just to generate descriptions of religious rituals once we give them sort of this broad definition of what is a religious ritual. Then we let them describe whatever comes to mind for them. Okay? And then ask them in a sort of structured interview kind of way enough questions that we can tell what their intuitions are in terms of repeatability, reversibility, the how emotionally evocative it was, the degree of sensory pageantry, and so on. Okay? And what we want to do is replicate that here. What we found in the previous study is actually that Boston and Macaulay, while they didn't get every single ritual just right, by and large they were doing pretty well. If you run the stats on it, mm, unlikely that, the, that they got it right this often by chance. Okay? They seem to be tracking on some general patterns, at least across those three traditions. And as I mentioned, Lawson came up with this through his expertise on African religions. So it isn't just sort of great religions or world religions, there's something else going on. All right, so, but what about Chinese rituals? Do Chinese informants have similar intuitions about the particular rituals? Now for this, um, the data I'm gonna present here are actually from Singapore, but they're ethnically Chinese informants from Singapore. And these are preliminary analyses. We're still getting a little bit more of the data coming in, um, some from mainland China as well. Um, but I'll, so I'll just give you a taster here. We used this modified version of what Brian Malley and I did previously, structured interview, asked people to name the ritual, um, what's the purpose of it, where's the supernatural agent active in this sort of thing, is it reversible, is it repeatable, are there special instruments that were involved, what can the emotional intention be like, and what's the sentence of repetitory like. 
Okay, uh, we've got uh, 49 Singaporean informants, really, not participants, because they're not the units of analysis, they're informants now. In this case, ranging from 26 to US, 65 years old, Buddhist, Taoist, and uh, ethnic Chinese are, are ways that they identify themselves. So here's an example of, of something that was generated. Um, tomb sweeping, honoring the dead ancestors, grave sites after ritual, we feel blessed from the ancestors, okay? Um, and this is a quote here, Ancestor Day is a Chinese festival in which Chinese people clean the tomb of their dead ancestors, bring offerings like food, uh, fruits, candles and incense and paper money, etc., and then bow and kneel in front of the tomb and later family feast on the food they brought as an offering. All right, I take it, this is sort of familiar to most of you. Um, and then we were able to ask questions like, well, is this a repeatable kind of ritual? Well, of course it is. You can do this multiple times, at least annually. Is it reversible? Our informant said, no, you don't, you don't undo that. Um, in fact, it's sort of inconceivable. But then it had relatively low sensory pageantry. Um, but its, special, its ritual form, using Austin and Macaulay's typology, is very clearly a special patient ritual. The ancestors are the special patient in this context, okay? And so actually this one, this example, fits their predictions. But I just put that up as an illustration. Other ones that are generated look this way. Um, uh, uh, different rituals in different uh, festival contexts. And actually all of these fit the predictions as well. Uh, I did some quick recoding actually and sort of reanalysis today, yesterday, um, or it was the night before, just to make sure, not that I was mistrusting anyone, but I came out the same way you guys did it anyway. Um, <laughs> and the uh, raw data that I had, uh, there were actually 24 rituals in this initial, my initial sort of gloss on this, that were generated by uh, these informants. 23 of them were special patient rituals, okay, of 24. Uh, only one was a special instrument ritual and zero were special agent rituals, which means there's nothing I can do with regard to that relative degree of sensory pageantry because it's a comparison across these types. And we don't have the special agent rituals. So can't really test to that prediction yet. We're still hoping that we'll get some special agent rituals. Um, and of these, 22 of the 24 rituals were considered repeatable, so consistent with Lawson and McCauley's predictions, and all 24 were considered non-reversible, which of course is perfect when you predict it. Um, so what can we say then? Well, it looks like these, at least these ethnic Chinese informants have similar intuitions about the features of special patient rituals, and I guess in the one case, the special instrument ritual that have been found elsewhere. Okay, so Lawson and Macaulay uh, predictions seem to be on safe ground for the most part. And again, it's with a, a funny subset of rituals. But special agent and special instrument rituals are relatively rare. And while the uh, absence of data isn't necessarily evidence of absence, we have other reason to think that actually the uh, amount of uh, production of participation in special agent rituals, at least in mainland China, but uh, it, it is, is very low. These aren't done very often, okay? That a lot of traditionally religious types of rituals, like say weddings and funerals, are now secular rituals, so they don't count as religious rituals. There's no God involved. There's no superhuman agent involved in the same way. Um, we could come up with other examples, all right? And that by itself is interesting because Macaulay and Lawson, one of the things they note, especially in their second book, their 2002 book, <laughs> is that it seems that most sort of a thriving religious traditions and religious communities have a balance of these, that you need all of these types of religious rituals. The special agent ones are good for motivation, for seeing the gods in action, making big differences in people's lives. And, and the more repetitive ones are good for, well, other kinds of things, like just keeping people sort of interested in a more day-to-day -day thing, seeing the immediacy of God's actions, and so forth. And when you get this out of balance, they actually suggest that uh, a religious tradition in this situation might be in a state of crisis. Um, and of course, I mean, that does seem to be the case with you know, the state of religion in China. It is in an interesting and unusual sense. Um, so there, that's something we want to follow up um, there as well. 
implications. All right, Macaulay and Lawson's predictions are largely vindicated here, which that says something, um, suggesting a common natural foundation of religious ritual reasoning. Um, the exceptional cases um, actually suggest the need, to, though, I think, to further explore additional cognitive foundations that may be at play in Chinese religious rituals and rituals elsewhere. What I didn't mention is the two that did not fit perfectly. One was a special patient ritual that's part of a wedding, and the other is a special patient ritual that's part of a funeral rite. Right? And in other places, in other traditions, usually the funeral rituals are special agent rituals, and usually the wedding rituals are special agent rituals. And so here we've got some exceptions that are kind of interesting and probably worth other exploration um, about why that is, what's going on there. Um, I think in some ways this project is, is a microcosm for the greater project here in that we are finding some vindication that there are some general, broad, pan-human kinds of patterns. But at the same time, there's some really interesting differences that push back on the sort of grand platitude sort of cognitive theories and say, we need some nuance here. Um, there's some other mechanisms that are at play that are worth exploring. And so with that, I will stop so that we have time for whoever comes next.